Well, good morning, everybody. You guys are asleep. You're coming to the early service. You're supposed to be the ones that are awake and ready for the day. All right? All right, so if you guys uh, are prepared and, and ready, if you have your physical Bibles, this is something I always do with my youth students, college students. If you have a physical Bible, can I see it? Can you show me if you have a physical Bible? Okay. Those of you that have a physical Bible this morning, just be prepared and ready because we're going to do an old school sword drill. All right, just, just, just for some fun. But is there anybody in here as we get started, anybody in here and I told you so person? If you are, you, not many will raise your hands, but if you have family members, you know exactly who the I told you so person is in your family. Aren't they the worst? Right? Like, aren't they just the worst people? Alyssa and I, um, being a, a, in our home, we now have two kids, and Declan, our oldest, he's now uh, three years old. And sometimes, like a typical, you know, toddler, right? He doesn't like to listen when we're telling him, you know, not to do something, and, you know, for, for his protection, right? We're like, hey, you should get off of that. You shouldn't do that because you know, there's a good chance you're going to fall off and get hurt. And what do toddlers a lot of times like to do? They say, whatever, like, I'm going to continue doing this. I'm going to disregard your advice. And they fall, they get hurt. And so there will be moments where I'm talking to Declan while he's, you know, in pain and he's crying. And I'll go, well, you see, that's what happens when you don't listen. Right? The I told you so moment of... Well, it's your fault, and these are the consequences. And then Alyssa will come in, and she'll say, you know, that's really not helpful. <laughs> and I say, you know what, you're right. Like, I'm not helping with this situation. And as followers of Christ, I think just like toddlers do, I think we present God with a lot of I told you so opportunities. But does he ever do the I told you so? No. But I think about this just for, for a moment. Think about this for a second. That God outlines everything for us in his word. But like a toddler, we're like, Psh, whatever, dad, I'm going to do what I want. Right? And do you know what follows our disobedience and ultimately our pride? pain and destruction and many moments of being disconnected from our Father. So if you have your physical Bibles with you, and if you need a physical Bible, please let one of the pastors know because we want to get you guys a physical Bible. I love, you know, technology, but something's different when you have a physical Bible. So if you have a physical Bible, can you turn to Haggai chapter 1. If you have your phones, you can do this. If you uh, would uh, like to follow along with some notes, you can go to our Flag Church app and follow along with our notes uh, as well. But if you have your physical Bible, turn to Haggai chapter 1. If you're the first one to get there, raise your hand. Oh, you guys, okay. There were were three all at the same time. You might have been there previously, but in Haggai chapter 1 verse 5, it says, Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Give careful thought to your ways. Now, God is not a I told you so God. But he does remind us to pay attention to our decisions that we are making. Because we have to live with the consequences of our decisions, right? We know that if we've lived any amount of time... You have to live with the consequences of whatever you decide. That's just what is a natural reality of life. And so plain and simple, when we look at this like spiritually, man, if I go to hell, it's not because God sent me there. It's because my decisions chose that reality. Right? Like I have a responsibility in this life. I can't blame anybody else. If I did it, it's my fault right? Like it's, those are the consequences that I deal with in my life. But does God want ruin for his people? No. Does God create us 
to see us go to hell? No, because he loves us and he wants to spend eternity with us. And so in order for us to experience abundant life in eternity with him, man, God is kind to us. And he gives clear instruction to us that we have to follow. He outlines it clear for us because he cares about us. Pastor Anthony uh, uses this phrase of that clarity is kindness. Because the more clear it is to you, the better it is and easier it is for you, right? That's what the Lord offers us in his word. And so we are going to look this morning at the Israelite people in the journey of rebuilding uh, the temple during their return from exile. And the backstory of this is in 2 Kings uh, chapter, chapter 17 to 25. You can go back and read this uh, later. And what's leading into this book of, of Haggai is that the Israelites had been um, in rebellion and they had ex- done all of this uh, covenant unfaithfulness with the Lord. And their unfaithfulness brought upon them destruction from the Assyrian and Babylonian empires, which then set, sent them into captivity for 70 years. So when we're at this spot in the book of Haggai, they're coming out of exile because in 538 B.C., King Cyrus of Persia allowed the, the Jews to return to Jerusalem. And so then during the years of their return from exile, God spoke through the prophet Haggai to the people, to the Israelites, and they were to rebuild the temple. All right, so they were to rebuild the temple. That's what they were supposed to do in returning. So two years later, construction began on the temple, led by Zerubbabel. And in Ezra chapter 3, verses 10 to 11, you can go back and you can also read the story of the building of the temple there as well. And in this moment, the they, they start the building and everyone's super excited. They've got trumpets and cymbals and they're celebrating. And so then in this, this section of scripture, it says, Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. So everybody's excited. But despite the glorious and excited beginning, after two years of working, the work stopped derailed by a lack of focus and discouragement. Derailed by a lack of focus and discouragement. And I think this sounds a lot like Christians today. Is that there are seasons that we are focused on our relationship with God. We're all excited. We're into it. We're celebrating him. We're giving. We're serving. We're wanting to spend time with him. But then things begin to take our time and our attention, and we lose focus. Or you're following Jesus, and you're giving your life to him, but then some negative situations take place into your life, and you become discouraged in your faith because you're wondering, well, why would God allow this to happen to me? Or why has he not answered my prayer? And we get discouraged in our faith. And in these situations of life, does God understand and have compassion for us? Yes. Thankfully, the Lord is a God of compassion and grace and kindness and goodness to us. But God loves us too much to continue to let us live without our focus upon him. And he loves us too much to let us live in our darkness and in our pit. And so what he calls to the people in Haggai and what he calls to us today is to return our focus and attention upon him. Because more often than not, it's our focus that is the root of our estranged relationship with God. It's our focus. Our focus. Not anything else, but our focus. Because despite negative situations in my life, if my eyes and my spirit is focused upon the Lord, I can be strong and at peace in negative situations. I can not allow busyness to become something that derails my focus upon the Lord. And so we read in Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 and 9, that this was the problem for the Israelites and exactly what God is speaking to them. 
It says in verse 1, it says, In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Sheatiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin while each of you is busy with your own house. So the Israelites... They told themselves that it wasn't yet time to resume work on the temple. And I think there were some good reasons to why they felt this way. If you were to read the story, if you were to read in Ezra, you'll see that the land was in bad shape after 70 years of neglect. The work was hard, right? It's not easy to build a temple with stone and everything that they used at that time. It's difficult work now, even, even harder back then. They didn't have a lot of money or manpower. They had suffered crops and suffered drought, and hostile enemies went against the work that they were doing. But in verse 2, it says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. So the people said that it wasn't time to rebuild the house. But what we want to focus on here is when he says these people. We never like to hear God speak to his people this way, saying these people instead of my people. He said this because he saw that their excuses and poor priorities were revealing that they were not living like his people. Now we need to remember that these were not bad people. Right? Like when we're looking at the Israelites, man, these people are terrible. Like how could they live that way? How could they reject what God is wanting them to do? They're not bad people. I mean, hundreds of thousands of Israelites went into captivity and only 50,000 returned. And the people that returned were the most committed to the Lord and the restoration of Jerusalem. So these are not bad people. So when we look at our lives, the Lord is not looking at you and saying, you're a bad person, and so you need to return your focus upon me and the things that I want. He's not just like calling us out because we're bad people. But the people said with their words that it wasn't yet time to rebuild the temple, but in their actions, what they were saying is that it was time to focus on what they saw as important. And so when we look at this section of Scripture, three things stick out to me. And the first one being is that our choices matter. And we can know that without even knowing Jesus, that our choices matter, right? But our choices matter when it comes to our relationship with the Lord. The problem with the the Israelites is not that they were bad people, but they simply had wrongly ordered priorities. Wrongly ordered priorities. It is said that they were content to let the cause of the Lord suffer, rather than give up their comfort. Instead, they should have felt no rest until the work of God was as prosperous as their personal lives. They should have been willing to sacrifice as much for the work of God as they were for their personal comfort and luxury. So the excuses of the Israelites, they sound familiar. But God saw through the excuses then, and he sees through our excuses today. The prophet Haggai was like an alarm clock, unwelcomed but necessary, right? You hate your alarm clock when it goes off in the morning, but if you don't have that alarm clock, guess what? You probably don't have a job, right? Or you don't make it to school and then you have to do summer school or whatever that looks like. The alarm clock is not welcomed 
but it's necessary. And so the Lord is saying, hey, I know you may not want to hear this, but you need to hear this. You may not like what I'm calling you to, but you need to receive it. It's necessary for your life. So verses 3 and 4 says, Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? So man, ask yourself this morning, are your houses or your wants more important than your allegiance to God? You can answer that right now. So this is not like a question that's just like blow past. Like you can answer it right now where you're at. Do you owe so much to yourselves and so little to your God? What kingdom are we building? What kingdom are we building? He says, give careful thought to your ways. And the Hebrew figure of speech for this phrase is literally put your heart on your roads. And so what the prophet Haggai was was wanting to do is he's wanting to consider what direction their lives were going and if they wanted it to continue going that way. So you know right now where you're going. You know what kingdom you're building. Are you building a kingdom for yourself or are you building a kingdom for the Lord? You would know that. Every step that you've previously taken up to this very moment in the seats that you are seated in, you can answer that question of where your life is headed, of what you are building. And the Lord is inviting us today to give careful thought to our ways because he has something better for us than the plans that we have for ourselves. You know, why do we always have enough time for the things that we want to do, but never enough time for the things of God and for God alone? right? Like, I never miss out on the things that I want to do, but God is always the one that I'm like, ah, didn't get to you today, Lord. I was so busy on everything else. Why? Because of kingdom priorities, misplaced kingdom priorities, because him and the things that are important to him in our mind don't build our kingdom, right? Reading God's word does not help me make more money. Reading God's word doesn't give me more time in my day to accomplish the things that I need to get accomplished. But if we saw God as a means of building our kingdom, then we wouldn't miss a moment with him. Right? If God was integral in building my kingdom, oh, I wouldn't miss a time in his word or with him. I'd be in it every single day because I want my kingdom to be successful here. It said that many Christians are like those ancient Israelites, somehow convincing themselves that the expense and effort for the things of God aren't worth it, while at the same time sparing no expense in acquiring their personal luxuries. He says that you drink, but you never have your fill. He says, you drink, but you never have your fill. If our priorities are wrong, then nothing will satisfy us. Because nothing fills the God-shaped void in our lives except putting him first. Nothing else can fill that. And we realize that as Christians, every time we try to fill it with something else, that we're always left empty and we're never excited or satisfied with what is there. So in verses 7 and 8, it says, this is what the Lord Almighty says, give careful thought to your ways. I mean, we see this repeated multiple times. Anytime something is repeated, it means you need to pay attention to it. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. That I may take pleasure in it and be honored. So what was taking place here is that God was saying it was time for God's people to start being concerned with pleasing him instead of themselves. It was the Lord's turn. It was the Lord's turn. Charles Spurgeon says that there is a set time for each of his messages to come to men, and God would have them give heed to every message as soon as it is delivered to them. 
So maybe today you realize that the route that your road is headed and the way that you have been living your life is that you have been putting your desires on the throne of your life. And today is the perfect day to replace that and put God on the throne of your life. In Haggai chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Then Zerubbabel, son of Sheatiel, Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. The people feared the Lord. Obviously, we know that this is not a, a bad fear of God. They're not uh, afraid that he's going to crush them and just annihilate them. That's not what fear of the Lord is. Their fear of God prompted obedience because it was a recognition that God is God. They were realizing that he is to be honored above all else. That's what it means to have a fear for the Lord is that, Lord, I want to do everything for you because I recognize that you're God and I am not. So your kingdom matters to me more than my kingdom because I'm not God. You are. So verses 13 and 14, it says, Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Sheatiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God. So they were given the instruction, and then they finally said, all right, yes, God is God. Let us go do what God is telling us to do. So they came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God. The stirring of the Spirit didn't come and go just as a spiritual experience. It wasn't just a motivational spark that dissipated once the moment was over. Because God is not an emotional experience that is just there to make us feel good. Right? I hear it sometimes where it's like, man, I need to get some Jesus in my life. Or, man, I go to God or I go to church when I need it. What do you need? Like, what, what are you expecting to get in that moment to feel good? about yourself. God is more than that. God is more than an emotional experience that we, that we ha- experience in a worship night or in, in worship on Sunday morning. It's more than just something that's a good feeling. It does something in your spirit when you have a recognition that God is the Lord of your life, that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You say, you know what? This is not something that just stays here in this moment, but I want to do something with it. And that's what's taking place here is that it was bubbling up in them. They're saying he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. There has never been nor will there ever be anyone else like our God. They're like, I need to do something with this. Because when I recognize God as the Lord of my life, everything else begins to pale in comparison. And I will follow him to the degree in which I believe. So their fear and their reverence for God prompted obedience. And then I also see that the obedience of God's people is part of how God works in our world. That God uses the obedience of his people to build his kingdom. Can God do all he wants by himself? Surely, he's God, right? He doesn't need you and I. But he chooses to use broken people like you and me. And this should be something that motivates us with humility and action. To be like, man, God wants to choose somebody like me that has not done everything right, that is broken, that is still sinful, that is not a perfect representation of him, and yet he wants to use me despite all of my past. I'm humbled by that. And then motivated because I'm like, man, if this God wants to choose me, he already set me free. I'll give him my life. I'll do what he wants of me. So God's work always requires the participation of his people. God's kingdom always advances 
through committed leaders and people who submit themselves fully to God's purposes. When God created you, he created you for himself. But what he also did is that he thought about everything about you and the role that you would play in building his kingdom. That's why every single one of us is uniquely created because he said, I'm going to create you this way and you're going to use this in my kingdom. That every single one of us has a role to play. When we receive Jesus as the Lord of our lives, we not only receive salvation, but we also get to step into the plans that God has had for us from the beginning when he created us. I think of uh, Paul in the Bible. We see Paul did all these amazing things in Scripture, but at one point Saul was Paul, and he was against God's kingdom, and he was persecuting Christians. But Saul was the same man in personality and ability as Paul was. But when God redeemed Saul and named him Paul, guess what? He began to use him who he was supposed to be from the very beginning for the building up of the kingdom of God. So the Lord says, I am with you, declares the Lord. We see this in scripture that he always empowers and encourages us to do what he commands. And finally, the presence of the Lord brings beauty to the temple. The presence of the Lord brings beauty to the temple. In Haggai chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? So when the people were building the temple, they were discouraged because some of them had seen the temple that Solomon had built, and it was more extravagant and more beautiful, and they were discouraged by what was there. But in verse 9... The Lord says this, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. So, so much work was put into the construction of temples in in, in Solomon and and the Israelites were discouraged by what they had built because it was in pursuit of making it worthy of the presence of God. They wanted it to be so extravagant and so amazing because they knew what resided in the temple. But God was saying this. He's, I'm going to take the less than glorious house and I'm going to bring splendor to it. That this will be greater than the previous temple. This would be the temple that Jesus would speak in. This would be greater things that would take place than the Israelites had ever seen. But they were trying to create something that God is saying, you don't create the beauty, I do. And this is exactly what God does with us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, it says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? And so God brings beauty to our lives when we receive him. He does a work in us, and then his goodness is shown through us to other people. So he takes a temple like us that doesn't look good, that is imperfect and makes mistakes, and then he says, oh, but people are going to see my goodness and my love and my beauty through you. The Israelites wanted the temple to be worthy of God's presence. We should care what state our body and temple is in, too. In Haggai chapter 2, verse 14, it says, in this, in this moment, the, 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 there's a conversation that's taking place about uh, things being defiled by uh, somebody touching a dead body and then touching food. And they're saying, would that food then be defiled because that person touched the dead body? And they say, yes. In verse 14, it says, then Haggai said, so it is with This people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord, whatever they do and whatever they offer there is defiled. See, there are moments in our lives where we find ourselves in a position of not caring what God says, and it poisons everything else that we do. I mean, do you not realize, do we not realize that our rebellion is rotting the possible fruit of of our lives. Just like the food contaminated by the person who touched the dead body, so our lives are contaminated by the things that we choose to engage with. 
I can do holy things like serving in church. I can give. I can attend church. But while I'm doing all of those things, it's, it's poisoning everything else. Because while I'm living in sin, all of those good things, it doesn't really matter. I mean, there's a reason in our relationship with him that we don't feel his presence in certain moments because we are coming to him with unclean hearts that we don't plan on allowing him to clean. And so the question this morning is, will our temple be holy? A place that is worthy of God's presence or will it be unclean? If the priorities of our heart are wrong, then nothing we do is holy to God. So he says, give careful thought to your ways. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, it says, if we deliberately keep on sinning after, after we have received the knowledge of truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. And what's that saying is, if I reject Jesus then the blood of his sacrifice, what we did this morning, is no longer covering it because I'm choosing to push it away. And when we, when we sin willfully, we are rejecting Jesus' work on the cross as sufficient. We disgrace him by rejecting his greatest work. We devalue him by devaluing what he did. But again, to end... In Haggai chapter 2, verse 9, it says, The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. And so when the book of Haggai ends, it ends with this hope of a bright future just hanging there. The what-ifs of life to be determined by the actions of the people. The what-ifs of our life to be determined by the actions of what we will do with everything that the Lord calls us to. Your life, your temple, can be filled with God's beauty. Your life can reveal the goodness and the beauty and the love of Jesus to those that are around you. The Lord is saying, man, like, great things have happened before, but man... I'm about to do something that is far greater, and I'm going to do it in you. I'm prepared to do something that you have never seen before. Dwight L. Moody says that the world has yet to see somebody that has fully given themselves to the Lord. Our world has yet to see that, but the Lord wants people that are prepared to say, God, your kingdom is the only king that, kingdom that matters to me. The most fulfilling life there is, is the one spent building the kingdom of God. Jeremiah 29, 11, if you've been in church a period of time, you've probably heard this. If you've not been in church before, you might have heard this too. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Would you stand with me this morning? We must remember that the Lord our God is for us. When we sang in Scripture this morning, because you sang Scripture when you sang the blessing, the Lord wants all good things for His people. He doesn't want ruin. He wants great things. But here's the reality of life. Your temple may not always look beautiful on the outside. But if the Spirit of God is in you, there is beauty that you cannot even comprehend. And there will be beauty that will be seen. So you may get sick. But the beauty and the goodness of God will be shown through your life. You may experience loss, but the Spirit of God will fill you with hope and with peace. You may not get everything that you want in this world, but the Spirit of God will make you feel like the richest person in the world. Because 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says, For you have experienced the extravagant grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that although he was infinitely rich, he impoverished himself for our sake, so that by his poverty we become rich beyond measure. So give careful thought to your ways, and let's build the kingdom of God. 
Because God is prepared to do amazing and beautiful things through every single person in here. And it's not about what your past has looked like. It doesn't matter what your exterior looks like. God, when he created you, he thought about you and he said, this is who I've created you to be. And I've created you for myself and for my kingdom. And there is a role for you to play in the kingdom of God. And he just invites you to turn your focus upon him so that he can have your way in your life and bring beauty out of nothing so that somebody else can see the beauty and the goodness of God. God chooses to use people like you and me because there are people like you and me that have yet to experience the beauty of Christ. So who better than to show the beauty and the goodness of God than people that don't always look like him and people that have negative and messed up pasts that he can say, oh, but you're not too far gone. You're not too messed up. Look at this person. Look, the, look, at, look at the beauty in their life. I'm prepared to do it in yours. So let's just step in and turn our focus upon Jesus.